The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. We appreciate you listening to The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. We don't do this podcast because we are former addicts. We don't do this podcast because we have loved ones who have suffered from addiction. We do this podcast because we feel that addiction is one of the biggest problems facing the world today, and that no matter who you are, no matter your religion, no matter your income status, no matter your race, no matter anything about you, addiction affects you. This podcast is a free resource for anybody looking for help with addiction. If you would like to help us in our fight against addiction, go to www.patreon.com slash the addiction podcast. That's www dot patreon dot com slash the addiction podcast and make a donation of whatever amount you would like. Thank you for supporting us. Hello everyone and welcome to the addiction podcast point of no return. My name is Joni Siegel. I'm the host for the podcast and my husband Steve Siegel is the producer of the podcast. We are co-founders of the podcast. We are closing in on the end of our seventh year of weekly podcasts and we sincerely hope that we have offered you some kind of hope if you are suffering from addiction or if someone you love is suffering from addiction or even if you're just in recovery and like to hear success stories. Our purpose is to give hope and to let people know that help is available. To that end, if you would like to become a supporter of our podcast, we have a Patreon page and you can check it out at patreon.com slash the addiction podcast 273. We this is a passion project for us, and we just thought we would ask our community if they'd like to support us with a small dollar amount monthly. Um, so check it out if you want to. Also, please subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star rating because that way when people Google uh, podcasts or help for addiction, then our, our podcast shows up and that's the whole purpose. Also, if you would subscribe to our YouTube channel and give us a thumbs up on our videos, same thing. That way, when people go to YouTube, if they look for videos with hints or uh, helpful hit tips about addiction and how to handle it, then our podcast will come up. And that's what we hope for. Today's episode is episode number 361, and today we have an interview with a gentleman named David Greer, and I'll tell you a little bit about him before we talk to him. He's an entrepreneurial coach, author, and facilitator. He lives in Canada with his wife, Carol Lee, and their three children. He helps people fully realize their dreams through his coaching, writing, and speaking engagements. David has been sober for 15 years after struggling with alcoholism earlier in life. He leverages his journey to sobriety and personal growth to help other entrepreneurs challenged with addiction issues. Even while living on a sailboat and homeschooling his children for two years, David drank daily to cope with his inner turmoil. Though David appeared successful externally during his drinking years, internally he struggled greatly before committing to sobriety. Without further ado, let's talk to David Greer. David Greer, thank you so much for being on the podcast today and sharing your story. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Oh, you don't know how mean I can get. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I do not ask those questions like, when did you stop beating your wife? That's that's for the mass media, and we won't talk about that because I def have definite opinions about that. But David, take us back. Um, we know you're doing fabulous things today, but just give us a little background. Where did you grow up? Um, I believe that you had um, an issue with alcohol, you know, and you can take us into that. But tell us about you when you were little and what your life was sure. like. Um, so I was actually conceived in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, um, as a result of a teenage pregnancy, uh, where my mom was sent to Edmonton, Alberta, uh, to a home for unwed moms. And I was born in Edmonton and immediately relinquished for adoption. Oh, in wow. fact, I doubt my birth mother ever held me. 
Um, and I was adopted into a, a wonderful upper middle class uh, Edmonton family as the first firstborn, the first child. Um, and three years later, my um, my parents adopted my sister. And three years after that, my mother got pregnant. Wow. And, and had you a hear that child. happening all the time where couples can't conceive, can't conceive, they adopt, they adopt, and then they have a baby. Yeah. And yep. I think they've probably been trying for like 15 years by that point. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, uh, my father took over the business that my grandfather started in 1923. So I come from an entrepreneurial family. What was the business, um, David? Just curious. Uh, the business was wholesale sanitary supply. So, um, you know, things to supply commercial janitorial services and um, and is now run by my brother. Last year was the 100th anniversary of the company. Wow. Um, and uh, yeah, less than 1% of businesses make it to the third generation of the family. So um, it it's, was quite a milestone. Um, but I, I'll... I'll get to that, but I I always wanted to take computer. I knew in grade eight that I wanted to take computers and business and put them together. And I wasn't going to be able to do that running the family business, and despite a lot of pressure from my dad to take it over. I, I did other things. But I just want to preface one other little bit. You know, my parents, I don't actually believe were alcoholic, um, but they were daily drinkers. Um, so you know, dad comes home from work, pours a scotch and soda for him and a gin and tonic for mom and that's probably all they had, or maybe that wine sometimes. I mean, they were really good partiers and binge drinkers. So, you know, I saw that too. Um, so, you know, my story, you know, eventually I became a heavy daily drinker. And I think part of that is, you know, it was modeled in my family of origin that that was normal. Um, but to this day, I don't really think that my family of origin parents, my mom and dad, uh, are um, alcoholics and uh, my dad passed away a few years ago but my mom is 96 and still wow. uh, lives independently uh, wow. in Edmonton. i try and get up and see her every six months and talk to her every couple weeks so uh, yeah it's very special um you know to be in my 60s and still be able to talk to my mom on a regular basis absolutely um you know i was an academic jock geek uh in high school um, so did lots of, you know, going to keg parties with football teams because that's what you had to do to be part of the tribe, um, and, uh, drinking after basketball games, but, you know, there was no, um, drinking in between. There was no drinking during the week. Um, you know, it was just part of what you did. Um, and then when I was 18, uh, I was really, I did one term of university at the University of Alberta, but I was really ready to leave home and my high school girlfriend had moved to Vancouver. So I left home at 18 and moved to Vancouver. Um, of course she broke up with me nine months later, um, which was my first true heartbreak. Um, and, uh, but eventually I went back to university. Um, and, uh, I asked my now wife out after a chemistry lab in November of 1976, um, no, 1977. So we've married 41 years. Um, university, you know, I played rugby at university, another great place to drink, um, you know, drank on weekends, was part of the science fiction club, drank with them. But again, it's like pretty heavy binge drinking, kind of early 20s um, kind of drinking. But at uh, that time, just more partying rather than drinking every yes, day. Yeah, exactly. Understood. Yeah. 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 Um, so my story is very much the progressive nature of the disease, mm. very, very much, right? Like it just keeps coming on, keeps coming on. Um, when I was in fourth year, I joined a young software startup as the first employee after the two founders. Um, I had to um, uh, apply to the 1980 International HP Users Group Conference to for a paper, which was accepted. And I took a week off of university to fly to San Jose. And uh, I remember standing on the side of the stage about to be introduced and like shaking like a leaf. Um, and, uh, you know, I, but I didn't, you know, I didn't need to drink over that. Um, but during that conference, I remember one night there was a dinner and uh, there was a fellow from Hungary there and kind of challenged me to drinking wine. And man, I was pissed and uh, ended up walking home in San Jose to my hotel and, you know, these 
car with two girls pulls up and wave to me and I go over to talk to them and there are a couple escorts who I'm not interested in, but they pickpocket me. Sometimes. The hardest thing about getting someone into recovery is getting them to agree to treatment. Bobby Newman, a certified drug counselor with 30 years experience and an over 85% success rate as an interventionist, has created a series of 12 videos that you can use right now to learn every step to get your loved one to agree to treatment. Call 866-989-4499 today. And say the word podcast to get a 10% discount. Or go to newmaninterventions.com and type in the word podcast for a 10% discount. This service comes with a free one-hour consultation with Bobby. We appreciate you listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. We don't do this podcast because we are former addicts. We don't do this podcast because we have loved ones who have suffered from addiction. We do this podcast because we feel that addiction is one of the biggest problems facing the world today, and that no matter who you are, no matter your religion, no matter your income status, no matter your race, no matter anything about you, addiction affects you. This podcast is a free resource for anybody looking for help with addiction. If you would like to help us in our fight against addiction, go to www.patreon.com slash the addiction podcast. That's www.patreon.com slash the addiction podcast and make a donation of whatever amount you would like. Thank you for supporting us. Oh and, boy. Uh, right. So there I am. 22 is one of my early experiences of both booze and, you know, um, not looking out for myself. And I'd tell the police I had to call American Express Travelers checks because that's what we had back then, you know, to get the money back. And I had to tell my boss and and his wife because um, that was the two founders. Um, there was named for Robert and Annabelle. So it was called Robel was the name of the company. Um, so I, you know, started with that company, um, helped build it, um, you know, progressively, you know, my drinking increased. I, but I, my story is one of very much a high-performing alcoholic. Mm. You know, I mean, sometimes functional. very, very high-functioning. Yeah. Um, you know, having a six-pack of beer and I'm still working on super, super complicated computer code, right, that <laughs> many, many moving parts. Now, there's a point where if I drank too much, then I'd spend the whole next day undoing the mess that I created. Um but, uh, um, and then 10 years in, Annabelle decided to retire. Um, I was offered to buy her shares. Um, and, you know, we it took everything that I'd saved for the previous 10 years as a down payment. And then I borrowed the rest from her, had to make payments over three years. And if I missed the payment, she could claim all the shares back, and, which is a fairly standard business deal. But I'm 32, I've got a four year old and a two year old. I left an accountant's meeting about that deal. One of the biggest accountants in Vancouver and tears were coming down my eyes outside the elevator. Mm. Um, and I'm sure I went home and drank. Um, and, um, you know, but where's the point where I became a pickle? Um, I don't know exactly. What I can tell you is that when my wife got pregnant with our first child, Jocelyn, um, I agreed with her, to, my wife committed to not drink while she's pregnant. You know, um, how great is that? And I committed to not drink with her. That lasted 24 hours. Mm. And uh, I actually, to this day, do not know how I squared that with Carolee. Like, I did somehow. And I'm pretty certain I was close to or at daily drinking by then. Mm. Um, so I can definitely tell you that uh, Jocelyn was born in July of 89. So, you know, fall of 88, I was a picker. Mm. Um, but I'm a super high performing pickle, right? So I don't have consequences. Um, and, uh, you know, we go forward and, uh, uh, our second is born and, you know, it just all continues. And uh, then after 20 years, the other founder, uh, Bob Green and I had a major disagreement about the future of the company and we settled it by him buying me out. 
You are listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information on the podcast or to reach out if you have a story you would like to share with us, go to our Facebook page by the same name, or you can email us at theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com or go to our website, theaddictionpodcast.com. And please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star review. We appreciate you listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. We don't do this podcast because we are former addicts. We don't do this podcast because we have loved ones who have suffered from addiction. We do this podcast because we feel that addiction is one of the biggest problems facing the world today, and that no matter who you are, no matter your religion, no matter your income status, no matter your race, no matter anything about you, addiction affects you. This podcast is a free resource for anybody looking for help with addiction. If you would like to help us in our fight against addiction, go to www.patreon.com slash the addiction podcast. That's www.patreon.com slash the addiction podcast, and make a donation of whatever amount you would like. Thank you for supporting us. And there I'm in early 2001. I'm not noticing there's this thing called the dot-com meltdown. So it's like a <laughs> terrible time to be going chasing technical deals. Um, but I'm networking like crazy and trying to figure out what the next thing is for me. And someone smarter than me sat me down and said, look, your kids will never be 11, 9, and 5 again. And she said, when I had a career break like yours, I flew to Australia and bought a VW van and went touring around for a year. And I literally had, there was literally the cartoon light bulb went off over my head. <laughs> Aha. And uh, my wife and I hatched this plan to uh, commission a sailboat in the south of France and take our three kids and homeschool them for two years while sailing more than 5,000 miles in the Mediterranean. Wow. And um, so we decided that like in February, end of February of 2001, and we left June 26th. So I was like putting in 50, 60 hour weeks and powering up with alcohol to get everything done. And if you want to be an alcoholic, being an alcoholic on a sailboat in the Mediterranean is a fantastic place to be. Mm. Wine costs about a third of what it costs in uh, Vancouver, which is very heavily taxed. Um, beer is about half. Um, any place you pull in anywhere in the Mediterranean is a restaurant sitting there, um, happy to serve you a beer. Um, and so, you know, I kind of drank my way around the Mediterranean with a couple exceptions. So a couple of things happened on that trip that um, I've come to appreciate once I got sober. Uh, one is, uh, we did a lot of overnight passages. And one of the miracles I didn't realize, but, and some of those were like two day or three day, nonstop, th like three days, days and nights, nonstop. And every one of those passages I never drank hmm. and I never wanted to drink. Um, because the stake, like the lives of my family were literally at stake. And that was enough. Like, I didn't really appreciate it at the time. I did kind of notice it. I think I might have even journaled about it, but um, like I really, you know, and then of course, as soon as we arrived, wherever we arrived, almost any time of day or night, a beer would get cracked mm. um, to celebrate the arrival, of course. Um, but I think, you know, that was the universe giving me a little tiny glimpse of a possibility. Um, the other was we were in our second overnight passage uh, in the Western Mediterranean Sea. And uh, we were motoring because there's a high pressure system, which also meant the skies were completely clear. And my 10 year old son, Kevin, was on the port side, the left side of the boat, and I was on the right side. And as far as we could see over top of us was the Milky Way. Wow. And it was so bright that the stars on the horizon we would mistake for other boats. And I think it was really, I think it's another time when the universe was trying to tell me there's something bigger something special. Um, 
And again, I don't think I recognize, I mean, I did recognize it for, remember, I actually hadn't been drinking. I was actually sober in the middle of the night. Um, so I could truly appreciate this um, and take it in. And um, um, again, I think it was just trying to be touched by that. And we spent our second winter in Tunisia and in it's a Muslim country, so they have Ramadan, the month of fasting. And I decided the month that they were fasting, I wouldn't drink. And I wasn't successful, but I, you know, maybe was only three or four drinks a day instead of eight or 10 or 12 plus. Um, and, and some days I actually didn't drink, but I white knuckled it, no program, like just brute force. Um, and, you know, Ramadan ended and I just resumed exactly where I left off. And I, again, no consequences. I'm still running this complicated trip about homeschooling kids and away we go. And, uh, and, you know, my wife doesn't see anything wrong with me or my drinking. Like, you know, her, her vision of an alcoholic as a truck driver, you know, or a logger, uh, get being in a bar and getting in fights. Well, and, and it also like, sounds like you weren't a mean drunk. You weren't beating no. her up or, or the kids up or anything. So no, yeah. I totally, yeah. totally the opposite. Yeah. Right. So, so not that experience at all. Uh, so came back from the uh, the trip in the med, and then you know I did a bunch of angel investing where you like invest your own money in startups, and you know I'm work I'm on board of directors, and I'm working for options. And after about three years, I don't really realize like just how frustrated and unfulfilled I am until I take one of my young CEOs to a training session with a guy by the name of Vern Harnish, who's produced a couple of books, and he has a framework how you plan your strategy and execution for a business, which is the scaling up one page plan. And his belief is you got to be able to get it all on one admittedly big page, mm -hmm. um, which uh, is the framework I actually specialize in, in my professional work. Um, and Vern was really interesting and I learned a lot from him, but what was more interesting is there was two coaches in the back of the room. I talked to both of them. One of them, coach Kevin Lawrence, after about five minutes conversation, he made me more uncomfortable than I had been in years. I had tears in the corner of my eyes. Hmm. Um, and I think all he said was, there's a hundred people in this room and almost all of them need your help. And, and I had not been able to find anyone who wanted my help. Hmm. And, and, you know, I just, and I realized that that moment, like how completely unfulfilling the work was that I was doing. Um, and remember, you know, by 24, 25 years old, like I'm 10 rungs up the entrepreneurial ladder and I'm now working with young CEOs and it takes me a year to get them up one rung. Like it's just, I'm just not working with people at my level. Um, so anyways, I took Coach Kevin's card and I had it next to me in my home office, right next to the phone. And I looked at it and I'm sure half a dozen times I thought of picking up the phone and calling him. And every time the phone weighed at least 10,000 pounds. And uh, that was way too scary a, a thought. Uh, thankfully, Kevin called me. Hmm. And he said, uh, hey, David. He said, it's Coach Kevin. He said, do you remember me from the Vern Harnish event? To which I said, yes. Skipping the part about, it's about all I've thought about for the last three weeks. <laughs> uh, and um, we, um, uh, we started working together on my 50th birthday. Hmm. August 9th, 1957, and, or 19, 2000, 2007. I was born in 1957. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, with Coach Kevin, Coach Kevin's the kind of guy who's like me, like it's all in or all out. Like there's no, no halfways. Mm -hmm. And so when you hired him one-on-one -on -one as a coach at that time, your first coaching session was two eight-hour days. Wow. Back to back. So pretty intense period. And uh, we started working together and we worked together for nine years in total uh, until Kevin stopped doing individual coaching because he wanted to focus on his strategic planning practice. Um, when he when I then switched to his, his coach, Nan O'Connor, who's still my coach today. But anyways, um, after 18 months, we had basically cleared all of the messes off the table and pretty much tidied everything up until there was one thing left. And on June or January 26, 
2009. I um, had my last beer about 10.30 at night. And uh, I made sure that I had no more beer in the house. Mm. And then I sent an email to Kevin saying, the topic for our coaching call tomorrow is my drinking. Did he know you were a drinker? No idea whatsoever. Ah, interesting. None. You you could you hit it pretty well. I was a master manipulator, hider, huh. isolationist, drinker. Um, yep, I okay. was very good. Very good at everything I put my mind to okay. in my life, right? And um, that I really, really work at. And drinking was something I really, really worked at. Okay. Um, so the next morning was Tuesday, January 27th, 2009. And um, he, um, he coached me to go to 12-step recovery. And I had such aversion. And I, to, to this day, I don't know where it's from. I don't know whether it's the stigma associated with alcoholism. I knew nothing about AA, but there it was. So he coached me past the aversion, being the expert coach that he is. And I, he got me to commit to go to a meeting by that Friday. So being the overachiever that I am, that afternoon I looked online because I knew I was going to a networking event, technology event and networking event downtown that ended at eight. So I looked online and lo and behold, at 8.30, there was going to be a meeting that was going to be a quarter of a block off of the main road. I would be driving down on the way home. Again, the universe just worked doing its put, magic. Put that meeting right in, right in your path. And so, you know, I actually, my event finished a little early. I probably got to the meeting about eight and I walked in it's in a legion um, which has a bar in, on the first floor. So I walk in and the doors are open and there's like three tables with beers on them. And I just literally like deer in a headlight stopped and I'm like frozen there. And a couple of people go into the meeting, they've got that nice sixth sense, you know, and they just looked at me and they said, Hey, if you're looking for a meeting, go down the hall and up the steps. And I went down the hall and up the steps which I later learned there's actually 12. <laughs> <laughs> That's so Coincidentally, funny. I know it's, it's really funny. <laughs> um, and uh, it's probably years it took me to admit, uh, uh, you know, how scared I was. I mean, I'm an outgoing, gregarious person for the most part. So I think being with a lot of other people wasn't scary. I think it was the fear of the unknown. And I was listening to your recent podcast with Marcy Hopkins and she talked about the fear of never, you know, the fear of never drinking again. Like how, you know, how am I going to cope? Can I, how can I have dinner without wine? Yeah, yeah. like how how am I going to cope? Like this was just an impossible thought, right? And all the kind of fear associated with that. Um, um, but uh, I got welcomed to young woman. Kind of, I was there's there was a back room and then the main room where the meeting was, and I'm kind of hiding out there. Um, and two young women came out uh, and just really welcomed me, and they were just really friendly. And uh, I went into the meeting, and it, it was a big meeting. It was probably 50 people, uh, maybe 60 people. And, um, you know, two, like an aisle up the middle and chairs in rows on each side. So I, I did go kind of halfway up, but sat right on the edge. <laughs> I wasn't getting really Get away. But I didn't, But I didn't do the back row like okay. most people do. Okay. <laughs> And uh, at that time, at that meeting, you know, the meeting kind of goes three quarters of the way through. And then they asked you, or is there anyone new to the program? And the chairperson that day um, paused probably 20, 30 seconds. And I sat on my hands and I sat on my hands. Then finally, like at the last second, I stood up and said, I'm David, I'm an alcoholic. And that was the first admission. I think mm. that was the... Well, first of all, I was sending the email because I'd worked with Kevin enough that I knew Kevin would never, ever, ever let me off the hook. Yep. Like I had that trust relationship with him. So when I pressed send, I knew the jig was up because Kevin would just, he looked like a dog with a bone. He wouldn't have let it go. Yep. Because now you've come clean and now he's going to yes. hold you accountable. Yeah. Right. And, and I trust Kevin to do what's best for me because we've done enough work together. Wow. And um, so I went back to that meeting a couple of times and then I made it my home group and it's still my home group today. Wow, that's awesome. Um, 
That's and, awesome. How did you, and, and I'm go sorry. Ahead. I was just going to no. say, how did you then turn your sobriety and your story into the coaching that you do? How does that figure in when you're coaching? Oh, so the, let me just like advance the story just a little bit more. Okay, sorry. Um, I was, I'm rushing you along. I don't mean to, but yeah. <laughs> no worries. Uh, you know, I want to make this work for you and try and keep it to a reasonable time frame. Um, so I also, but I, I do a couple of really important things. So I found that home group. Um, two or three weeks in, I found a private men's step group. Uh, meets every Monday at six o'clock. And I've been going to that group for 15 years. In fact, I joined it by Zoom from Mexico last night. Um, we generally meet in person at one person's house, but we Zoom in for like people like me. One person couldn't make it um, due to weather and I'm in Mexico. So a couple of us joined in Zoom and the rest were in person. And that's been instrumental because we read from 12 Steps and 12 Traditions. And I got to hear so many things. I got to hear men share about their conception of a power greater than themselves. I got to see men cry and I got to see the other men not do anything about it. Interesting. Like I remember the first time in that group, someone cried and like, it was all I could do to not jump up and go over and pat them on the back and say, it's okay. And, you know, I eventually have realized that that was all just about my discomfort. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. With yeah. those emotions. Yep. Um, but David, you know, how we, is it, sorry to interrupt you, but how is it private? Like people, like obviously it's not listed you have, in a directory. Like you I have to see. hear about it. How did you hear about, about it? I was at a breakfast meeting and I talked to one of the attendees and he said, Oh, I go to this men's meeting. Why don't you come okay. and here's its location? And um, I got it. it. It turns out he was supposed to call the facilitator and kind of get me cleared first, but he didn't. I, I just showed up. I showed up. And you're also supposed to take it if you do suggest someone, you're supposed to go with them. I got which it. He did, which he didn't do. <laughs> okay. But, it's okay. It worked out. Yep. Yep. All and, right. So yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I, I interrupted you. You were talking about watching someone cry and you realize it was your discomfort, not theirs. Yeah, my, my discomfort. And yeah. that, that's still an area that I'm still working on being comfortable with negative emotions. Um, you know, I've come to realize my biggest fear is I'm weak, mm. you know, and, and crying is like a sign of weakness. It doesn't have to be, but I, you know, that's the story that happens for me. Um, so just to fast forward it, so I keep working with Coach Kevin. We find some new entrepreneurial gigs. I'm basically helping other entrepreneur friends of mine, usually in a sales and marketing role. Um, and now I'm sober. Um, I, a um, couple years into that, I work for a friend of mine who has a company in Ottawa, uh, in the Ottawa Valley. And I was probably two, three years sober. And Burke and I had known each other for 30 years, so I, when I first, when he was suggested hiring me, I told him that I was an alcoholic and in recovery. And I spent three weeks working in Vancouver and one week working at the office, um, actually staying in Burkitt's apartment above the office. Um, and so I, I went to rural meetings in, in Ottawa, which was a very interesting experience because they're a little different. You know, every AA meeting is the same and every AA meeting is different. Right. Um, and then, uh, you know, I mean, warning Burkett that he didn't have enough customers and, you know, he had some challenges in his business and eventually really listened and figured that out. So then he had to let me go because I was costing <laughs> too much. Um, and then uh, another friend of mine, I ended up becoming a VP of marketing of this telematics company, publicly traded 35 million a year. It's the biggest kind of company I've worked for. And I was there for three years and I came out of that gig and I realized I do not a couple of things. One is I do not want to prove to anyone that I can work hard. I have done this over and over and over. It is so, I've come to learn is so baked deep into me. Like it's deep, 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 deep. My taskmaster spirit is fantastic. It lets me get so much done, um, but it doesn't always serve me. Mm. Um, so my goal is to work less hard, which I'm getting better at slowly. Um, and then I wanted to give to other entrepreneurs the gifts that Kevin had given to me. So I made the decision to become a business coach like Kevin. Mm. And I wasn't at that time really thinking about the sobriety thing. I think it was kind of in the back of my mind. I was more thinking of all of the business and entrepreneurial and things that I'd worked with Kevin on. Um, and um, 
So I, I took coach training and I, and, um, you know, I launched my practice as one-on-one coaching and then I do strategic facilitation for entrepreneurs and their senior leadership teams. And then about, well, then my current coach, Nan O'Connor, for a couple of years, every time I talk about my sobriety, she would just comment how the energy on the call was so pure hmm. and like my knowledge was so deep and broad. Like there was no question she'd ask me that I didn't have some suggestion about related to recovery um, and alcoholism and alcoholism in the workplace and how it shows up. And so um, I guess three years, maybe four years ago, I made the decision to um, like publicly um, come, you know, focus on this being a business coach, but uh, one who focuses on entrepreneurs who are challenged with alcoholism and addiction. Interesting. And, uh, and it turns out naturally I've actually attracted some of those even before I went public on it. <laughs> and then others like through podcasts like this have come to me and said, Hey, I heard your story and I'm four, four years clean and sober, you know, and I run the business with my dad, but I really could use some help. Interesting. And, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and, you know, some of the, th- you know, just at its core level, someone who's like in 12 step recovery, like me, when we're on coaching calls, there's just like, I can reference a higher power and it like makes sense to them. Right. Right. Yep. Like when they're having trouble letting go of an aspect of the business, I could say in recovery, what would you be doing about this challenge? Mm, and they're like, yeah, yeah, right yeah. away. Oh, it, I'd be turning it over. Yep. Okay. It's a point well, of reality. The, yeah. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. And, and the re- you know, the truth is we have like, we, if we're lucky, we control like 1% of the things around us. If we're lucky, even as business owners mm-hmm. who really think like we control things, <laughs> but, but we don't. Right. And, and I believe actually, you know, the strongest leaders, the best entrepreneurs are the ones who set up the situation. So all the people that work for them can succeed, which is, you know, clear goals, um, good coaching, um, being able to listen. Entrepreneurs are terrible at listening. And I was mm. terrible until I got sober and really worked on it. You know, I think if you're really trying to listen to an employee and their challenges, you should be letting them talk 80% of the time and you should be talking 20% of the time. And most, most entrepreneurs, it's it's reversed. Um, and then there's just um, situations with, uh, um, you know, I, I have a number of clients who are in super high-end sales. So multi-million dollar deals. So there's an expectation the CEO flies down and has dinner with the senior poopas of the business they're selling to, you know, the chief financial officer, whoever, you know, and they go out to dinner. And, and you know, one of my clients a while ago, who's not an alcoholic, but he said to me, like, we went out to dinner and everybody had one, two drinks before dinner. And then we drank a bottle of wine each. He said, is that normal? And I said, well, I said, I consider that alcoholic drinking. And yes, in that situation, it is normalized. Yeah. Um, but see it for what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Then I've helped. He He's wanted to like just not have as much alcohol in his life. Um, and so, you know, so I've helped coach like, what do you, if you don't have alcohol, what do you do in those situations? Um, which is sometimes you come clean. Sometimes you just say, for health reasons, I've decided not to drink. You always make sure you have a drink in your hand even if it's a glass of water. Yep. Um, same with networking events. Like some of these things apply to all senior executives. They're not exactly. necessarily just business owners. It's just business owners tend to go to more charity events, more networking events, right? So they they have to cope more often. Yep, yep. And sometimes it's just what's the practical strategies um, around that. That's great. Um, I mean, that's, that's a lot because... I mean, I I went to the, a ribbon cutting for an actually a senior facility recently, and pretty much everybody I saw there was walking up to the bar to have a dr- glass of wine. I spent most of my time there just drinking water. You know, now, I don't what? have a problem with alcohol, but it it's just it's amazing how commonplace it is and how accepted it is. You know, you were mentioning your parents were daily drinkers. Mine were until they were, they hit somewhere in their eighties and they just decided that they didn't want the extra calories. So they quit. But Mm -hmm. the whole time I was growing up, 
you know, and I remember very clear from my adult life when I had my kids that it was it was two Manhattans, rain or shine every day. And they had a motor home and they always had the bottle of bourbon and they always had the driver Muth. And that was just that was just what they did, you know, and it was just it's it's accepted. It's considered accepted. David, if someone wanted to reach out to you and get coaching from you. I don't, I'm not sure I know what your website is. What, do you have a website? Uh, yep, coachdjgreer.com. So that's coach, D is in David, J is in James, Greer, uh, dot com. Um, Google David Greer Coach. Um, I should come up pretty high as well. Um, and uh, the top of every um, page on my website is my phone number and my email address. So um, awesome. that's the easiest way to get a hold of me. And I, I like that. I, it's not like you only deal with people who are in recovery, but I think sometimes for people who are in recovery to have someone that's helping them who knows what it's like, I think that's huge. You know, it's it it's like it's like when you tell kids not to do drugs and we have our friend Michael DeLeon and when Michael goes into the schools, he's like, I was arrested twice. I was ready to spend the rest of my life in jail. So they, they know from where he comes. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. like you yeah, have, totally. You've been there, you've experienced, you've done it and you've come out the other side. And I think that that, I think that that would resonate with people in recovery. So I think that's huge. Yeah. If we have a couple more minutes, there's like one other aspect I introduced in the very start of my life that I'd like to come back to, which Absolutely. is being adopted. Um, so um, a lot of my personal growth has been around relationships. Um, like Carly and I were very codependent, basically didn't work that much on the marriage for 30 years. And in the last 10, you know, done eight years of relationship counseling. And, you know, now I choose to stay in the marriage despite the challenges because that she's the perfect person for me to have my next stage of personal growth. Um, and, you know, through all of this, um, and that codependency was important to move beyond because I didn't want to look for my birth parents for a long, long time because of fear of what my mother's reaction would be or fear of hurting her. Your adoptive mother. My adopt, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mom, mom. Got it. Yeah. Mom, mom. Like, mom, yeah. <laughs> mom, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I had to come to a point where she's an adult and she's allowed her feelings. And I'm an adult and I need to do the things that are right for me. And her response is whatever her response is. It took a long time to get there. So nine years of sobriety, 60 years of living. Um, also turning 60 and like, you know, even if my parents were teenagers, like, you know, what's the chance they're alive? Like you, you start running out of the possibility. So, um, so when I turned 60, I did apply for my adoption file and um, I did find both my birth parents who went on and married other people. Um, and the first person who I talked to was my birth mother, um, which was just uh, over five years ago. And, uh, you know, it was uh, kind of classic alcoholic. So uh, I told her why I was calling. I don't know what the heck you're talking about. Then I explained that I'd got the adoption file and how I kind of figured out she was my mom. and. Those adoption people, they never should have shared that information. Mm -hmm. So blame about that thing that she just said she knew nothing about. Right. And then she said, I want nothing to do with you. Okay. And uh, remember, this is the first person I've tried in all of the birth reunification. Um, and uh, yeah, that I did take it personally at first. Oh, um, heck yeah. And uh, I would have, but you know, I, I went for a long walk and I called my coach and I called my sponsor and, you know, and I, I just uh, stayed in, you know, being in nature and like, I just stayed in touch with the universe and uh, maybe not that day, but you know, very soon when I was sharing that story, people said, you know, your birth mother has no idea who you are. So she can't reject you because she doesn't know who you are. That's right. She's rejecting. She doesn't know you. Yeah. And, um, uh, and I did, I did, had figured out on my maternal side who like my siblings were, and I knew how to contact one of them. And I said, I'm going to reach out to other Ridley family members. Ridley is my maternal family name. She said, I don't want you to do that. And I said, I can appreciate that. But, and, and I had coaching around this and what kind of approach to take. Um, 
And I did reach out to my sister and um, about 10 days later, my younger sister wrote me a beautiful letter welcoming me to the Ridley family. Aww, it was actually lovely. an email, but it, but it was but the that's letter. lovely. Yeah. It, it was really beautiful. And um, I mean, my uh, sister is in, was just in Portugal and she's in England right now. Um, and you, you know, the three of us, and my wife have been WhatsApping back and forth every day. Oh, nice. And, uh, I got to meet both my aunt and uncle. Um, and I've since uh, met my birth father, um, and my three brothers, all four of those guys are bigger than me. Oh my goodness. Like I, and you know, I'm six to 240, like, and I have 46 inch <laughs> chest. I'm okay. <laughs> I am big and it's really weird to like go with these other men that are bigger than you they're are all bigger yeah. than me <laughs> I but take I know it your dad was more welcoming than your mother he was intrigued ah, is what okay. he told me did he um, not know about you he knew right he knew but I don't think he knew what sex I was like oh, once, okay. Once, he just knew she was pregnant. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The, the grandparents took over everything that happened. I see. Okay. After the discovery of the pregnancy. I see. Um, but I wanted to circle back to my mother because in April of last year, um, so my mother, I heard from my sisters, my mother was an alcoholic. Mm. And, um, and my, I have a brother, Gary, who I never met because in 2015, he died of cirrhosis of the liver as a okay. direct result of his alcoholism. Yep. yep. Um, and in April, my sister called me and said, uh, Terry's gone into the hospital with a brain tumor and okay. has a very short time to live. It was like Saturday morning. Sunday, I talked to them again. Monday, I flew to Calgary. Tuesday morning, um, the entire Ridley family, my aunt, my uncle, my sister's uh, they all invited me to the hospital room and my birth mother was unconscious at that point. So she couldn't complain about my presence. Yep. Um, but I was truly welcomed into the room. That's nice. And, That's lovely. Uh, and two hours later she passed away. Okay. And, uh, we all had a lot of tears. Um, I don't think I was crying for Terry. I was crying for everybody else and yep. their loss and, yep. you know, and uh, 15 or 20 minutes later, my Uncle Jim came to me and said, do you want a picture with Terry? And the internal dialogue was, no effing way. Right. But the external. And the loving parent. So I've now spent almost five years in ACA. So I've had a lot, tremendous amount of personal growth through that program. And the loving parent of me said, you will never have this opportunity. You will never have a picture of you and Terry if you don't do it right now. Yep. And so I kneeled down on one knee next to Terry and Jim took the picture and then I stood up and I kissed her on the cheek and wished her well. That's lovely. That's a, um, that's a great, that's a great cap to your story. I appreciate that very much, David. Yeah. And, uh, the next day, so just to complete the alcoholism piece, the next day, my uncle Jim, my two sisters, they go to her, she's in a assisted living place, but lives independently. Open bottle of Canadian rye whiskey in the kitchen cupboard and a case of unopened 12 sitting in the closet. There you go. So I was curious whether she was an alcoholic right up to practicing alcoholic right up to the very end. And I think as far as I'm concerned, the answer is that yes. Would be yes, absolutely. Yep. And, uh, yep. you know, sad that she never had an opportunity for any healing and, you know, to carry that toxicity of having me for 65 years, like what a burden to carry. Yep. Well, what a yep. horrible burden to have to carry, but exactly. And, yep. um, uh, and the, you know, the other really, like my uncle has said to me repeatedly, she says, I keep telling Terry, if you just get to know David, you'd really like him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like that is just so heart touching. Like yeah. when Jim said that to me for the first time, like here's this uncle who didn't know me until five years ago. And like, you know, he's been my advocate. Yep. Yep. Um, well, so we took the time to get to know you and, you know, yeah. And, I, and, and to be fair to myself, I have put a lot of time and effort into building these relationships yep. and, you know, the one groups in Calgary, the others in Toronto, I've done a lot of trips, you know, and put in time and effort to get to, to build one-on-one -on -one relationships with these people. So, I, um, which has been really rewarding. 
Yeah. I, that's it's been incredibly rewarding. Um, I think that's and, beautiful, I, David. I think that's beautiful, and you know, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, any last words of wisdoms you'd like wisdom you'd like to leave with our audience? Yeah, you know, I'm public about my alcoholism for two. I, I have two primary purposes for why I I am. Um, one is I want to reduce the stigma of alcoholism and addiction. It's a mental health disorder. It's an alcohol use disorder, substance use disorder. It's a mental health disease, and that's what it needs to be treated as. And no amount of pulling up by the bootstraps or thinking it's a moral failing is ever going to get someone clean and sober. And so, um, you know, I hope that by sharing my story and being public about it, I can somehow reduce that stigma associated with it. And then for anyone who suffers or for families, for people around those who are in addiction, um, there's hope. Um, and you know, if an alcoholic like me can get sober, then I know, honestly, then, you know, there really is hope. And, and I guess the third message I have is my belief is we can't do it alone. Yep. The, the mind that, that got me to be a drunk is not the mind that could get me sober. I had to have other people who could really um, show how my mind was tricking me. And, and I had to hear a lot of stories and, and slowly over time and doing the steps and the work, you know, as, as we say in 12 step recovery, it's, it's not a program of thinking, it's a program of work, rolling up your sleeves and, and doing the hard personal work, which, and it is hard personal work. Yep. Um, but as I've tried to share my story today, you know, um, I can show up for other people as a coach. I can show up for my birth families as son, nephew, brother. And I still show up for my mom and for my sister Jane and my brother John. And I do it sober today. That's awesome. David, thank you for talking to us today. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Once again, David's website is coach, C-O-A-C-H, D like David, J like John, Greer, G-R-E-E-R.com. That's coach, D-J Greer, Dot com. And you can reach out to him if you are an entrepreneur and maybe you're in recovery or even if you're not in recovery and he can help you. We'll be back again with another interview next week. You have been listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information, reach out to us on Facebook or go to www.theaddictionpodcast.com. Dot com. Our email is theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com.